She starred in two of the biggest horror films of the 80s. She is the dream master. And today on the Slices podcast with Jason Poligra, we sit down and talk all things Nightmare on Elm Street with actress Lisa Wilcox. Hey everybody, welcome to the Slices podcast with Jason Pellegra. On the show today, the lovely Lisa Wilcox from Nightmare on Elm Street Part 4, The Dream Master, and Nightmare on Elm Street Part 5, The Dream Child. Welcome, Lisa. Thank you. Hello. Hi, nice to, uh, nice to meet you and uh, let's have some fun. So uh, first, uh, I just wanted to, I, I saw you, um, you were in Texas for a snowstorm. Yes. Wasn't so, that just beautiful timing? <laughs> <laughs> was that how often do you go to Texas? <laughs> um, I actually was just in Texas um, earlier that month in Houston. Oh, okay. Um, and then, um, and I go to Texas a fair amount, I would say. And I've also okay. done quite a bit of filming in Texas as well. Um, so, uh, yeah, lucky me. It's a cold front moving in. But we had three events, one at the Texas Theater. That was um, the, the, the day that the over 130 car pileup happened oh. on their main freeway. And it was uh, sold out. Of course, it's limited capacity, but it's an amazing historic huge huge theater it was yeah. going to be a drive-in event but uh-huh. too cold so they moved it inside but even then so it was sold it was the 80 tickets sold um 22 people showed up oh, yeah and then the next thing we were at, at at a haunted house which was really fun um again limited because it was cold and freezing and yeah. texans do not like to drive no. out when it's snowing, they are not accustomed to snow. I don't blame them one bit. And then we did a <laughs> signing at, there's a wonderful show I've done many times called Frightmare in okay. Dallas. And so uh, it was not a Frightmare show, show, but the promoter Lloyd actually owns a wonderful toy shop. So I did a signing there. Again, we didn't have as many visitors as yeah. we would have liked. Yeah. Um, and then I got stuck in Dallas for two days. My hotel two went out days. of power for nine hours. Nothing compared to obviously what happened, the demise after. Yeah. Thank God uh, my airline let me know that um, my flight was rescheduled and this and that. And uh, anyway, it was, it it is the weirdest thing to wake up in a hotel because my phone battery was dead. Mm -hmm. My computer was dead because the power went out at three in the morning. Oh, geez. While they're sleeping. (laughs) And I wake up and I'm like, there's no lights, there's nothing. The stairwell is black. It was very creepy. So anyway, wow. yes. Yeah, so I'm gonna be call- so now I'm gonna being called. So my agent and manager down there were calling me um the uh the weather master. The we- <laughs> <laughs> well, because I've had hit some nasty weather. I did a show in Florida once, hurricane hit. There, there's been some tornadoes have happened in Chicago. It's just I bring it with me. I guess I guess you're the, <laughs> I, I guess you're the evil weather master because I don't know why you would yeah uh, maybe we should add evil <laughs> evil I think so because you're not exactly like, bringing don't know. yeah <laughs> that's yeah it's unfortunate I mean it started off as kind of like a quirky story but then they really uh they really struggled uh down there so. they really did yeah but um all right so let's talk nightmare so um Nightmare on Elm Street Part 4, uh, we're going to start from the beginning and we're going to go into auditions, but you had been in some stuff before. A lot of people come into these movies and they really hadn't been in too much, but you had done some TV and uh, and had some spots here and there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'd done a couple soap operas um, and I've been doing commercials since I was a teenager, since I could drive yeah. uh, and, you know, print jobs and that kind of thing. And I had done uh, Hardcastle McCormick. I don't know if you guys remember that show, but Hardcastle no. McCormick, I did a guest star on that. So I had a little, I had a little bit, and of course, lots of theater, tons of yeah. theater, because that's my training. All right. So you, uh, how'd you get the call for the audition for Elm Street? Well, um, so out of UCLA, I got, because I did uh, main stage theater there, and I got an agent, a manager, and an agent, you know, through performances and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So Michael, my manager at the time called and said, well, I've put you up for Nightmare on Elm Street 4. And I was already a fan of Nightmare on Elm Street. I'm a fan of horror anyway. And I'm like, really, really? Oh my God. (laughs) And he says, but they won't see you. They won't audition you. They have to understand. (laughs) I had virgin platinum blonde hair. 
I look like a cheerleader. Okay. Uh It's the glam makeup and that's my headshot right now. My, my resume shows Grotowski, UCLA, all kind, you know, and my bit of credits and stuff. They said, I just do not look anything like the role of Alice that they had in mind. Right. Anyway, a month goes by and he, Michael says, well, you have an audition for Nightmare. And I'm like, great. Well, Annette Benson, the casting director told me later that they had auditioned like seven over 700 actresses for the role of Alice and they couldn't find their Alice. So they went through their trash can pile. Hi. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. The reject pile. I was rejected. And I finally got my opportunity to audition. Uh, And, you know, I went in with like dirty hair, no makeup. I wore pale yellow, which is like my worst color, especially Mm -hmm. if you're not damn pale yellow is not good. Um, Did my thing. I read with uh, Tuesday night because she was Mm -hmm. the first uh, after cast for the Mm -hmm. film because she had to reprise Patricia Arquette's role and they wanted her to look kind of, you know, blonde, you know, that Mm -hmm. kind of thing. So, and then I had... um, one call back and Brooke Thies was actually in the waiting room hmm. too. I went in on a Friday and did my call back and I got married on Saturday, huge <laughs> wedding. I'd been planning 150 people uh, off to Hawaii for a honeymoon and learned on my honeymoon that I had booked the role. So life didn't get better than that, right? I guess that's, a, that's a mic drop. and <laughs> I know. <laughs> wow. Right? What yeah, well, my story. honeymoon was ended early because they wanted me to come back to do some photo tests and stuff. They asked yeah. me if I would dye my hair. Yeah. Um, I said, I'm really afraid about having it dyed. Can we do a rinse on it? And they said, okay, we'll do that. Well, guess what? I may as well just dyed it because think of putting like red brown paint on white. Yeah. It stains my hair. Oh. And that rinse had to be put on every single morning. Yeah, it was so- very wet and slimy. Two blow dryers at my head blow drying it you know then Rennie would call you know we're gonna have you know a a rehearsal whatever and I'm like wearing this apron and brown oh you know (laughs) but anyway I have no regrets though I have no regrets yeah no but it's yeah hindsight being 2020 so what did what uh do you remember what you read what scene you read for in the audition yes it was the scene in front of the high school with Tuesday and we're sitting on the bench and she's smoking a cigarette. Okay. It's the scene about, oh, we have matching baggage. Yeah, yeah, Ma- yeah. Matching yeah. luggage. Matching. And, and I remember part of the Dream Master rhyme that my mother had taught me, who, of course, is deceased. Um, so, yeah. And that was the first day of filming, actually, was my birthday, April 27th. <laughs> Honeymoons, yes, <and> birthdays. Was- <laughs> I know yes. it was like a good thing. And then of course the first day they put the rinse on my hair and I'm like, Oh my God, this is wild. <laughs> oh my God. That's hilarious. What was the, uh, what was day one was, uh, what were, do you remember what you shot day one? Yeah, it was Venice high school. Venice California. High school. Okay. Yeah. Which is and, Los and, Angeles area. and it was that scene, the matching luggage. So you, you auditioned for that and that was your first scene. Yeah. Was there, that's kind of, to me, that's kind of strange. Like it's a, it's a neat, um, it's a good scene because you get to see, um, you know, uh, just a kind of like the the downplayed aspect of your character. Um, but for a horror, you always assume that, you know, there's going to be a little bit more intensity in an audition to see if the actor can match that. Did you have anything in a callback where no? Eh? No, not that I recall. It was always that scene. Yeah. Oh. Um, th- maybe. No, it was always that scene. Um and um, Tuesday always likes to say that she cast me because there was one other actress that they were considering. Yeah. It was between me and someone. And, and Tuesday's like, oh, no, no, no. Lisa Wilcox won. She's got this Alice. She's she's Alice, you know. Yeah. So, um, so actually, you and you know what? She was, uh, I had her on the podcast a couple of weeks ago. And, oh. Uh, yeah. And she, uh, and she echoed that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm she sure she it, did. <laughs> she made it calmer. She didn't say, "Oh no, no, no." She didn't have sass in her voice, but she, <laughs> she definitely said that uh, you know she um, she saw more in you, and uh, which is kind of cool. It um, is, yeah. Yeah. So okay, so you're on the set of Nightmare on Elm Street, and you're a fan. You said you you came in as a fan because you know I've talked to people, and while they they they're so appreciative of being involved in a lot of these films. Funny enough, not a lot of them are fans of horror or the the franchise they're going into. So you were a fan. How 
how cool was that? Super cool. <laughs> oh my gosh. To meet Robert England. And yeah. I mean, seriously. And I mean, and I love dream yeah. warriors. I love the first one and I love mm -hmm. dream warriors. Um, and I love two too. I have much more appreciation for two and yeah. uh, seeing uh that's my dog in the background. No, Chester, we, what are you we've had plenty at? of dogs on this podcast, funny enough. <laughs> uh, oh, I'm sure Tuesday had her dogs too. Um, I don't know, I if not, they were walk walking through or something. Chester, mm. what are you barking at? I have a miniature uh, dachshund that I rescued. Oh, really? Oh, Chester? Cool. Oh, he just is, like, we'll just ignore him right now. Yeah, yeah that's no problem. I can, <laughs> I can, I can ignore him. Um, I can only have a controlled environment by so much. No problem. No problem. Like I said, we've had dogs that were, we're a dog friendly podcast. So, um, all right. So, okay. So you're, you're on set and, um, like what was the, what was the overall vibe of Nightmare on Elm Street part four on set? Um, for you, anyway. it, it was a great vibe. I mean, mm -hmm. I really feel that, I mean, I had a, this was a really big role mm -hmm. and I had a lot of responsibility and it was a, a difficult role because, you know, we don't shoot in sequence. You know, mm -hmm. we'll be doing scene four in the afternoon, we'll be doing scene 58, and then we'll go back to scene two. And then, you know, yeah. we're all, it's all over the place. But it was really important to me to, because um, every time one of my friends past died, I bring on their, their strengths mm -hmm. and their weaknesses too. Yeah. Um, so in my script, I had written out every single scene who had died by then. So I could gauge <laughs> yeah. the level of strength that I wanted to portray in that scene, right? Wow. I had to do that so I could just go to page, you know, scene 58 and go, okay, okay, I'm at this point of yeah. strength and power. And, you know, it's, so it's I- Very clever. It was, yeah, it, it was intense. I mean, it was, you know, I had a, I had a big responsibility, mm -hmm. um, but we all got along just beautifully. Yeah. And um, I like to say to Annette um, Benson and say, you know, you can't, not only did you, cast as actors but you cast friends for life wow. so because we're we're very close and tight family yeah we really are robert is like my uncle robert you know uncle what i mean robert. so <laughs> he's got a lot of nieces and nephews uh yes uh, he sure does running around <laughs> and, and he sounds like it seems like he's he's proud of that so that's great he is. Um, He's very proud of us. Yes. Where's the? Was there a? Was there a scene in particular that was uh, challenging for you? Where it was, you know, beyond, you know, just being a difficult acting piece, but like, you know, whether it was the elements or the shooting, was there a scene that stands out as being very difficult for you? I think the most daunting, um, like the just straight on acting scenes, mm -hmm. that was easy. You know, it was more scenes that required the action, like in the church and yeah. the fight scene. Um, part of that is filmed in this church with beautiful production mm -hmm. value. Oh my gosh, oh, yeah. just really amazing. Um, but we were doing this sort of, I don't know what the word is, but we're up actually like on a stage about mm, five feet off the ground okay. and it's limited space. And yet we're circling each other on this space. And we did have stunt um, coordinators, you know, you know, it's like the trampoline, you know, yeah, <laughs> you yeah. make sure we fall off, but we'll be caught. Yeah. So, so that was tough and it was, you know, kind of physically grueling. Yeah. Um, uh, so I would say that was probably the, the hardest, yeah. the hardest part. Was there ever oh, oh, wait, and oh, yeah, no, <laughs> um, old Alice. Okay. Old, old Alice. Alice in the diner. They did, they tried three different kinds of makeup on me oh, wow. and then at one point my mom was gonna play <laughs> me as old alice right because we look yeah. a lot alike she's a redhead by the way alice. okay <laughs> um but they said she looked too young <laughs> <laughs> Way to go, mom. and she did <laughs> yeah she yeah did. And, and you know thank god mom and dad thank you for your jeans because it's yeah. really not the cigarettes and red wine that's keeping this young face so <laughs> <laughs> um yeah no i guess i mean that's a great compliment for her and i guess yeah if they cast her then they had to do uh aging makeup on her what was the point you might as well just do it on you yeah um wow that's <laughs> that's a pretty neat story were you Diff were you treated any different being the main star of Nightmare on Elm Street 4? Nah. No, no mm -hmm. I, you were just, just mm -hmm. one of the gang. No. I, I think some of the cast members thought I was just um, standoffish. Not, 
like they were, I was just married. You have to understand. So I'm going home to a husband, Mm -hmm. you know, I'm not going and hanging out with them on the weekend. You know what I mean? They had more of an opportunity to hang out and bond much more than I did, but I'm now a wife and have this lead role in a film. And, you know, it was intense. (laughs) Um, And not to say, no one ever said it was bitchy or anything like that. No, but it was more like I had to kind of focus, you know, I was focused on and I was like the older woman of the girls and the guys, you know what I mean? And you had <laughs> already, one. you had already cut your honeymoon short. So you had to, your husband had to get some love, I guess. Right. Like, you know, I know. Like, right. <laughs> so <laughs> it's understandable for sure. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about um, working with Rennie. Um, you know, Rennie was a, uh, Rennie Harlan who um, directed Nightmare on Elm Street part four. Uh, he was a very big contributor to, how uh, beautiful the film looks and how um, the scale of the film. Mm -hmm. What was he like working with you? What was your relationship with Rennie? Rennie was great. He was like, even though there were, I'm sure things going on behind the scenes and whatnot with whatever budget, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. He never, ever brought that energy to set. Never, ever, ever. You could always approach him. Um, he, he was open to ideas and he was just a calm, like a rock, Gibraltar, yeah. you know? Yeah. And, and, and in that meaning that, you know, you can work with directors that are intimidating and you're just like, okay, I'll just hit my mark and do my lines. And yeah. this guy's not approachable at all. I'll just do my job. Yeah. Um, but with him, it was, I felt more of a creative collaboration and I'll never forget a scene in the diner um and you know as an actor you're finding like your busy work well what am I doing before I start my lines what am I mm-hmm. doing well I work in a restaurant so I was looking where I was set and there was you know silverware forks knives spoons but I'm like okay I'm going to be um cleaning them right mm-hmm. you know with my dish towel or whatever and when I'm doing that there's this amazing shadow that happened on the wall and I'm doing um forks and I'm holding up for it like, oh my god Rennie, 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 check this out, you know? He's like, oh, oh. <laughs> and he takes the forks out, gives me the knives. So mm-hmm. there's a quick shot in the diner where you see a shadow of knives, like Freddie's glove, obviously. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that just came out of being, uh, feeling safe and comfortable and on yeah. set. And there's all kinds of little things like that that happen in the film, which of course add to its depth, you know? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, he yeah. was great. Good. And so, um, and I mean, you know, in fairness, he, I mean, he's gone on to have uh, a pretty decent career. Um, but uh, <laughs> he, um, you know, he was just starting out like this was, you know, a big gig for him. So, um, you know, I guess he wasn't, uh, he wasn't too far evolved, but it's good that, you know, he was mm-hmm. in control, like you say he was, because that's, you know, that's 90% of directing. Um, yeah, he wasn't, you know, you can deal with directors that are screamers on set and mm -hmm. oh gosh, you know, which are just so uncomfortable to deal with that. Um, Mm -hmm. I've only had that experience twice in all the movies and TV I've done, but it's really, really nasty. Oh, another thing, um, Rennie's mom, her name is Lisa. Oh, (laughs) okay. So (laughs) so there's so many tie-ins, there's so many like uh, interwoven, Mm -hmm. uh, um, so with Rennie, um, were you, you kind of mentioned the, the knives and how that evolved, uh, organically was, uh, was he up to, um, like with your character, did he leave it all to you or was he providing input and, uh, was he open to, you know, you kind of him, giving him some, I mean, he would direct us if necessary, but we just kind of did our thing thing you know yeah. we got cast he got to see what we were capable of um I can't think of him over directing me or anything like that I just like did yeah. my thing you know yeah and so he seemed pleased with it so <laughs> yeah yeah okay so I am let's let's dig a little deep because it's it's well documented that there was a little bit of uh you know controversy with uh Rennie and Tuesday night on set um we won't get you know, too into it, but from your perspective, um, did it, um, what, I mean, true or false or whatever, uh, the scenario was, did it affect the set negatively from your perspective? I mean, we, we kind of knew like, like Tuesday was his favorite, you know, we, we just kind of knew it. We accepted that, whatever. And, 
and 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 I don't know, but it didn't affect the energy. I I don't feel like. I mean, he still treated us all respectfully and mm-hmm. lovingly and caringly, and as creator, you know. So I mean, it just kind of became like a joke. Yeah. <laughs> on, on set, you know, I'm sure Tuesday told the picture about her her bathing suit, and it kept getting smaller and smaller. And, yeah, yeah, she. You know, like no Tuesday, <laughs> no the buttocks are fantastic. You know, what I mean? <laughs> so so we we. There was no hostility that I sensed at all. all right. We just kind of like rolled our eyes, like, "Oh, Renny and Tuesday, oh, Renny and Tuesday." Uh, okay, so. so it wasn't really, uh, it wasn't hostile, but it was because the. Uh, I mean, she she did, you know, mention that it that it did uh, affect her on set. Like, you know, it was something that you know over the years it's water under the bridge. But at the time, you know, it was it was difficult for her, and in particular, hearing it back on the Never Sleep Again documentary. Um, you know, so, uh, from her perspective, I think it was a little bit, um, different, but, you know, I guess that's maybe it affected her more than it affected us, you know, mm-hmm. and yeah, it was rumor they're having an affair and this and that. We, I knew that wasn't true. She was dating Andros for God's sake. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Yeah. So it, it's, it's kind of like, um, I, I wouldn't say at least my perception was no big deal. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so who does the best uh, Rennie Harlan, uh, uh, impersonation? Because you, you all seem to do it every once in a while I'll hear. <laughs> so I'm just curious to know, how, were you doing it on set or was this something that happened afterwards? It happened afterwards. Okay. I think, I, I don't remember on set it being, but we can't, it happened afterwards, you know, I, yeah, I love and, it. I love uh, hearing and you. Tuesday does the best one, She's you know, we winner. all give her that vote though. I, mine's improving. <laughs> it's, <that's good. laughs> you're improving your deep finish accent i believe yeah, yeah right um okay so you're 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 on name on street you know and you're coming in as you kind of alluded to this cheerleader look you're you're a gorgeous young actress coming in and you know you're you're the lead in a franchise that you want to be involved in and they have to dull you down to the point where you like was that kind of annoying big time man big yeah time. i mean they were like pale face greasy hair um oh mustard yellow sweater (laughs) what oh what a poor poor pitiful thing but it was perfect it was perfect because that was alice yeah so to me that gave me great joy because it was that because i do work from i work from the inside out and the outside in both Mm -hmm. you know to create a character and i honey i've been i've played from nuns to prostitutes okay so and that's the beauty of and why i love what i do yeah is creating characters yeah exactly believable characters you know yeah so and also alice too i mean the Alice you see in the beginning of four that was totally me in grade school i am not kidding you Okay, even as a teenager, I didn't even want to wear makeup. I was actually turned into kind of a tomboy, really. Didn't want to do makeup. I had short hair. Um, so, yeah. So, so you were able it, to jump into it. And- yeah. And I still look at it when I watch it go, oh my gosh. And they, they, you know, it, and to see her evolve. Yeah. You know, well, she, yeah. I mean, the character arc physically, as you watch Alex, Alice, was perfect. I mean, it was. Yeah. From dowdy to shy, wallflower, daydreamer, daydreamer girl, slowly, slowly she comes out of her shell. And it's not like you see her that way and all of a sudden she's up here, Mm -hmm, right? mm -hmm. It was gradual. It it was gradual. And I think um, makeup and wardrobe and, um, you know, uh, I think we pulled it off. And great acting. (laughs) <laughs> okay thank you um the you know it's funny because you talk about alice and her arc and i mean it's so defined like i mean there's not very many films um you know especially in that genre where a character starts at one you know spectrum and ends up at the other one like there's even um there's even characters that you know are in three four films that don't even get that kind of an arc you had i mean you had it all in you know, one movie. So that must have been kind of fun though too, right? It was a blast. It's a it's an actor's dream to play that kind of role. Mm-hmm. Um a role that is not one dimensional at all, you know? Yeah, no. All very dimensional. Um and I think that's too when I read the script, I was like, oh my God, this is me growing up. Oh my gosh, this this is so I like I read it, I was like, 
I got this, yeah. you know, I, I got this, this person, yeah. because that's part of me. So, um, I mean, really? Brian Heglin, who wrote the final screenplay, who's gone on to me, do amazing things. Mm -hmm. I really feel like the Nightmare Before screenplay is, is just beautiful. It's just a beautiful yeah. story. I would agree. I would definitely agree. It's uh, um, like from, yeah, from uh, the, and I, there was a lot of changes throughout the film. I, that was my understanding. The script kept changing and, you know, for it to. Well, you know, they say that I don't, <laughs> I don't remember getting, I mean, yeah, but see, you always are going to get what happens when they do a rewrite or change it. Okay. So your script is white pages, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Then you're going to get, get, get pinks, which shows the change. Then you get yellows yeah. and you're going to get green, then a shade of green, then the blue, then the, yeah. da, 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 you know, yeah. get all, you know, and it's, I think pretty typical on um, films that they're going to change lines and change. Plus we have the writer's bill strike happening. Um, so Andras and I actually did write a scene, one of the scenes. Oh, really? That's um, nice. it was the scene where, um, his girlfriend in life and in the movie yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tuesday has died Okay. and I'm sitting in the den. Um, and I'm just watching an old video of her oh, yeah, and yeah, yeah. my brother and Brooke and yeah all that and um they're rolling around playing two i think toy new perks in it too mm -hmm. and then andras comes in rick and says you know alice what are you doing and then i'm like i had the dream and i could feel the heat i could feel the fire he's like stop this ready crit you know all that stuff yeah. we wrote that scene together really that's a yeah. great scene and i'm not just saying that that's like i mean because that is that is an eight that's 80s right you're watching home videos of your friends and it just it was like bang on Look at you. Yeah. yeah. Huh. No, we, 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 we knocked it out. I think yeah. there might've been one other scene we tweaked or did something to, I don't remember. I know Andras will can tell you about it when you have him on your show. He'll tell you all about that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, that's a, that's a great scene. And um, you know, because like I said, you, you relate to it, like anybody that's lost anybody watching a video and stuff and it just, you know, it really hits you and uh, oh, that's very impressive. And it's great that like, you know, you were able to, have it in the film and uh that doesn't happen very often <laughs> yeah no it's pretty cool <laughs> so um so okay so you mentioned that you were newlywed on this were there was that a challenge was that difficult for you yes How because so? um well <laughs> uh he's now my ex-husband okay. and um we had two beautiful children like two beautiful boys but he and he was even in the industry but i would come home and he'd be like on the cat i'd be like i don't know it was like 10 30 i get home you know i'm working a 12-hour day and mm -hmm. whatever and he's like you know you need to tell that director that you just need to be home by 9 p.m and I'm like, um, I don't think I can do that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so he was a real. He said that SOB. he was in the. <laughs> okay, wow. Well. He was a real sob. Really? He did not make my filming experience supportive that... at home. Um, and then when the film came out, because mm -hmm. um, he's from a very famous family and this and that, so he's used to being like. Yeah. The, yeah. Uh, so then we're, I'm going to events and he's coming with me, we're going to premieres, we're doing this and that. And then, you know, you have all the paparazzi, you know, at the event, mm -hmm. they're like, and they're calling him Mr. Wilcox. <laughs> 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 oh, <Okay. laughs> uh, he didn't like that one bit. So uh -huh. anyway, a lot of his true <laughs> colors were uh, revealed. Um, yeah. Well, he did this film and after the film. So I was going to say, it sounds pretty early on, but um yeah, if he was in the industry, I mean, he should know that like coming home at 9 p.m. isn't exactly standard. <laughs> I and you don't control the schedule unless you're a big star. You know yeah. what I mean? I mean, you 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 can't ask me like that. So it was it wow. was a so that's where the stress was. The stress wasn't yeah. from doing the film. The stress was when I got home. Yeah. To this, mm, it was you know, that's that was hard because then I feel guilty and I'm going to set because I was quite I was in my mid twenties. Yeah. And but this was my first like good meaty role yeah you know sure. so yeah that was hard big uh, uh meaty role in real life and a meaty role in uh, yeah right, in screen, right? right. So, yeah, yeah it's a very good point yeah um did you have a best friend on set 
have a best friend on set. Um, I don't Harold mean to Berger single out really anybody. Cool. Who? Sorry? Harold. Berger? Harold. Oh, yeah? Yeah, we totally <laughs> hit it off, man. That's we, cool. Yeah, we, we really, really did. Um, and, you know, the gals, I mean, I'd say Harold was like my best friend on set, honestly. Yeah. Um, and hair and, and hair and makeup, they, they um, were, we were close to, um, it's later on where, um, I became much tighter with like Tuesday and with Toy Newkirk and yeah. Brooke Thieves, like Toy Newkirk. She lived in New York for quite a few years and then she came to LA and she lived with me for a year. Right. Mm. Uh, awesome. Brooke Thieves, her son and my eldest son were the same age. So we would go bowling. You oh, know, wow. it's like it was over time. And then Tuesday, of course, we started a jewelry company called Tobrights that we did yeah. for like 10 years. But that happened way after, way after filming. After, so. Yeah, I remember. I think, I think I followed your Facebook page if, if I remember correctly, but uh, I was so, always so showing support. Yeah, we had that happening. But, but Harold, I'll never forget. Um, my best friend, too, and always has been our books. I'm a big reader. Uh-huh. And I would be in my trailer. Okay, script line changes, got it down. Okay, now I'm just, I'm going to read my book. So, and I was reading a Dean Coop's book okay. and um, Harold saw it and he said, oh, have you read the, the movie Watcher? Have you read the book Watchers? And I said, no. He said, oh, it's excellent. You got to get it. I'm like, okay. So I got it. So I was reading Watchers mm-hmm. on set during Nightmare 4. So years later, yeah, what happens? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I did Watchers 4. Yeah with Mark Hamill, talk about fanning out. He's like, <laughs> oh my God. That's amazing. Um, and uh, yeah, anyway, wow. I just thought four yeah. must be my lucky number, I think. <laughs> Maybe, yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's pretty, that's pretty funny. Um, so, okay, let's, I want to talk about uh, Robert England a little bit and mm-hmm. your relationship. So, um, you know, you had a couple of films to work with him. And I mean, I know there's all the, the you know, the, the conventions after and we'll talk about that after but what was he like when you first met him oh he was just warm and lovely and introduced himself and he didn't have any kind of ego about himself at all either he's totally yeah. down to earth um yeah i mean we would be like <laughs> i'd be getting my hair dyed which took you know the rinse thing whatever mm-hmm. and he's getting makeup put on and we're just chatting and it was just, you know, it was so interesting as the, you know, Harold's p- putting it all on him and this and that. Mm-hmm. We're, and we're talking about like, he was redoing his bathroom or something. <laughs> and I love home design and decorating. So mm-hmm. we're talking about like grout colors. <laughs> he gives with the tile. And it was, <laughs> it was riveting surreal. Stuff. It was Rivet- fun. <laughs> but yeah, it, it was just very much like we're actors at work. We're doing our yeah. job and, and here we're just shooting the shit as I say. Yeah. That's and that's but see the reason why you know I bring it up is because you know he has such a reputation of being such a, a, a gracious you know you know actor and person you know because he's at that point he's been in a bunch of them and you know he's seen people come and go and but you know I never hear a bad story about him and just for him to be such a, almost an ambassador of the series like you know as people come in I mean it, it didn't have to be that way I mean the guy who played you know Freddy Krueger could have been a complete jackass nah. but it's i think it's so amazing that he wasn't you know and uh and that everybody has such amazing stories about him yeah no he he was great he he treated us very kindly too because we're younger yeah. actors and exactly. he's already had um v you know he's mm-hmm. already had success and and yeah. whatnot but no he was very um he was just very very lovely with us awesome and it wasn't like he was bossy or said you need to do that here's an idea like he just let us be and he was just very considerate and sweet like a dad yeah well that's cool um okay so this is going to be a little bit different so take me through i want to go through um you know people who don't have any kind of a production um you know background or anything like that what is a typical day for you on Nightmare on Elm Street Part 4 from waking up and getting in a car and driving to set. Then what happens? You get, it was mostly in the studio, was it not? Well, Well, we had several, we had quite a few locations. We'd been to high school. We had Mm -hmm. Kristen's house, um, which by the way, was like two blocks from where I lived. And it was a night shoot. So I said, you know, 
don't bring my trailer. Just I'm, I'm two, I'm, I'm two blocks away. Just call yeah. me when you need to be on set and I'll be there in five minutes. So, <laughs> nice. um, we filmed down in Culver city, um, which was a set, several sets. Actually we filmed, I mean, we, Oh, we had the, um, Los Feliz fountain, at the end mm-hmm. of the movie. Yeah. We had, we had fairly, fairly yeah, amount you did. Of, yeah, you um, did. locations. Um, for the most part, about two weeks of it were night shoots. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the rest of it were day shoots, like in a studio or whatever. Okay. And, I, and then eventually we ended up, I think in Valencia. So that was, a, that was a drive. Yeah. That, that was a drive, but you know, we're driving at, you know, 5 AM, no yeah. traffic. Yeah, exactly. I guess so. <laughs> yep. Um, okay. So let's, let's go through the studio. So you arrive at the studio. Let's let's kind of go through I, a day. I sign. I first AD. I'm here. Settle my stuff in the trailer. Head straight to head, hair and makeup, which was an hour because of the hair. Certainly <laughs> wasn't an hour because of the makeup because I was like wasn't wearing any. Okay, yeah. Yeah, that's <laughs> <Especially>. right. <laughs> um, and so hair, and then sometimes while you're, and then of course first AD is constantly coming in. What's ETA? ETA? When is she mm-hmm. ready? Makeup has to stay five minutes, ten minutes, whatever you're gonna say. Um, and then usually we would do some kind of rehearsal, uh, with Rennie, Mm -hmm. um, sometimes pulled out of the trailer before we're done or I'm done and we do our rehearsal and then that's finished wardrobe and to set. Cool. So you do your set, you do your, I mean, you do your scenes and, uh, yeah, and you got the wide shot and you got this and the close-ups and this angle and that angle, blah, 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 blah. And, um, and then, you know, set up for the next one. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that's pretty much an actor's typical day, you know? Yeah. yeah. And, uh, awesome. On. Cool. Thanks for the, thanks for walking through that. Um, okay. So after the film, the film hits, okay. So it, it, it gets released, you know, you know, you're, you're in a, uh, you know, a nightmare film, but you probably don't have any idea that it's going to be as big as it ended up being. So take me through what's going through your head. You're the star of a massive summer blockbuster. Well, it was it was very. I mean, it was super exciting. I'll I'll never forget. Um, I had a I threw a party after we saw the screening. So we went to Westwood, mm-hmm. a real theater in Westwood, to watch it, and they had seats blocked off for us, and we had no idea what to expect. It was completely sold out. Um, my dad rented a limousine nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, and my grandma from Irvine was there for the premiere in Westwood. Oh my gosh. Obviously and she's a big Freddie we fan, went, right? <laughs> Huh? Obviously she was a big Freddie fan. Well, <laughs> she was then. She became one. <laughs> she became one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was great. It was just, it was really magical. And we yeah. watched it and people are laughing at the jokes and people are getting spooked and people like we, we were looking at each other going, oh my gosh, this, this turned out pretty good. Don't you think? I'm, yeah, I, I yeah. think so too. Um, so we were, we were really jazzed. And of course, you know, like the next day, whatever reviews from East to co- East to West coast, you know, were phenomenal phenomenal so and i've learned along the years too of what other movies came out during that time and this Mm. and that and i was like and we beat we were the big we were the big box office hit yeah for weeks for weeks yeah that's awesome did did life change um other than getting my blonde hair back finally um (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and then no one recognized me I mean, oh yeah, really. that's, yeah that's true <laughs> which is fine but um no you know i got a, a couple interesting um audition opportunities and whatnot um i have to think about them more but there were you know some yeah. really good movies um but no i mean you know it finished and yeah so let's, okay, I want to talk about that. So, I mean, you're the, you, you know, you're in a name on street, which, you know, the, the franchise was big. The movie was big. The movie was well done. You're the main star. You, you know, you're, you did a great job. I mean, was, you know, we're like, I would expect, you know, you'd be opening doors and they'd be flying open. And what did that happen? Like, do you, they did. That's did, what I did. I, 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 I just should I just can't remember the name. Yeah. Uh, Ro- um, not Romeo versus. Oh, heck, heck, heck. Um, put on the spot. I'll, I'll think of it later. Oh, okay. Um, 
but yes, some doors were open for auditions for like big roles. Yeah. Like there was a male, what is it called? Romeo is dying. Romeo is bleeding. Yes, Romeo is bleeding. Yeah. Okay. Um, and that after and it, um, six and a half weeks. I always think of him as six and a half weeks. <laughs> uh, this is terrible. I know. Now you're putting me on the spot. <laughs> Aha! Uh, you want me? Do you want feel, me to? Now you know what it feels like. I okay, know. Google it. There you go. <laughs> I'm Why the interviewer. I should be prepared. Okay, hang on. Anyway, I got to do a screen test with him, um, but it turned out Elizabeth McGovern, I think, ended up doing that. And then there were other opportunities too. But you know, I audition. Even then, you know, they're not going to just hand you a role. You still have to audition. And yeah. looking back, I wasn't right for the role. Really, I mean, doors open, but um, to Gary Oldman. Romeo's okay movie. then that was that, that okay that one i didn't do the screen test with him there's another movie i did i can't think of it who's the main actor in six and a half weeks sorry Go who's the main actor in six and a half weeks That's stupid. i'm sorry guys i'm so embarrassed <laughs> this is riveting <laughs> riveting radio right now uh okay Now, are you, sorry, are you, you saying six and a half weeks? Are you talking nine and a half weeks? Nine and a half weeks? Yes. Nine and a half weeks? Yes. Sorry. Okay. Well, that's Mickey Rourke. That I knew. <laughs> Mickey Rourke. Mickey Rourke. I did, yes. a screen, okay. I did a screen test with Mickey Rourke. <laughs> okay. Okay. I was going to suggest, I was going to say nine, but I didn't want to correct you. And I was like, you know, I mean, it's, it's nine and a half weeks. Plausible, it's been a long that's time. Six, six and a half. You know, and I'm getting yeah. closer to 60 years old, guys. So you got to give me a break. All right. No. <laughs> No, we're not. We're going to refuse yeah. to believe that. We're going to refuse to believe that. Okay. So with Mickey Rourke. Okay. And nine and a half weeks. Okay. That makes sense. I was like, wow, they made another. <laughs> I got a weird nine and six and a half weeks. I don't know why six and a half weeks. It's nine and a half weeks. Yes. It's okay. Anyway. You sped things up for, for Mickey, the, Mickey for Rourke. The yeah. And then I had the opportunity with the other one and, you know, there yeah. were some cool things, but um, I didn't book any of those, but I mean, I did a commercial, you know, TV, Nas Landing, you know, yeah. a bunch of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Nas Landing. Um, okay, so part five comes around. That did come mm -hmm. around. And uh, um, so they come to you. What were your thoughts on the script? Oh, well, I I mean, I really liked the script because there was so much. There were a lot of dialogue scenes. Mm -hmm. You know, there was a lot of dialogue and interaction, um, much more than Nightmare Before. Yeah. Um, and I thought that was pretty cool. Also, I love the script that um, Alice has, you know, reached her grown woman, you know, mm -hmm. um, she has completely evolved, has confidence. Um, I, I think, and you know, it's interesting now after doing like autograph shows for about 20 years now, um, you know, Nightmare 2 and Nightmare 5 were like the least liked, right? I'm going to tell you in the past two years, mm -hmm. Nightmare 5 is a favorite. Okay. And one, because it's the first one they saw, whether it was the theater or, you know, yeah. watching it at home, right? Mm -hmm. And a lot of times you become more, most attached to the first one you actually see. Yeah. But also it's, it's that, think about 1989 and Nightmare 5 deals with some very, very heavy, heavy subject matter. Mm -hmm. We're talking about teen pregnancy abortion yeah. adoption perhaps by someone we also then have greta's character bulimia yeah. anorexia then we have my dad who's now a recovered alcoholic mm -hmm. alcoholism and then of course we have the champagne and the truck and yeah. danny dies yeah. there are some really heavy heavy duty subject yeah. matters yeah. that were part of you know discussions that weren't talked about over the dinner table necessarily yeah you know what i mean yeah so in 1989 it was just too it was too heavy yeah. you know was subject that matter were those subject matters that you mentioned uh were they uh were you aware of them at the time or is it like looking back it's like holy crap we hit a lot of nails it's looking back yeah okay yeah, yeah i mean i didn't look i didn't look at it in reading it that of uh, the impact that this story would have on an audience member. 
Mm -hmm. I'm reading the scrap desk yeah. after just going, wow, this is cool. This is cool. This is cool. But the impact on the audience never, I, I can completely understand how it, mm. it, it, it was not <laughs> accepted. It's yeah. Not yeah. nearly as well. There's no jokes in Nightmare 5. It's a whole different can of beans. Yeah. You know, it, from it, it four definitely. to five, it's like, you know, we got Freddie on the beach wearing Ray Bands and now we've got <laughs> Nightmare 5. You know, what's going on? Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so did it seem like um, a different set? Because now, well, it was a different set, so it obviously seemed that way. But what I mean by that, <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> I brought my A game here. Um, but so what I mean is like Nightmare 4 plays fun. You know, you've got relationships for life. Um, Rennie Harlan was, you know, knocking it out of the park. And part five comes around. It's darker, a lot more you know, understated than the fourth one. Did it seem that way on set? It was definitely it? a different um, environment on set. Um, and, and Stephen Hopkins, who's an amazing artist, by the way, he did all, he drew all the storyboards and that set with the Escher set and the stairs mm -hmm. and all that. I mean, that was really, really something to accomplish. Um I would say there seemed to be more tense tension on set. You know, we'd be mm -hmm. like, you know, he and the producer are arguing, but in front of us, you know what I mean? Mm. And, and we're like the actors were, and we're still young. Yeah. And it's like, oh, mom and dad are, mom and dad are fighting. Oh, yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? That kind of energy. Um, so yeah, I, it, it was, it was definitely a little different. Yeah. Did you feel different on set? I mean, you were coming back. You were the star of that one. You're the star of this one. Um, did you feel, you know, a little bit more of a responsibility on that set or? You know? I felt more confident, Yeah, you know, because of the success of Nightmare 4 and the success of the character and mm -hmm. all of that. So I definitely felt more confident. Uh-oh, my battery on my phone is 20%. Hold on. Uh -oh. I may have to go get my charger. Uh -oh. uh, I think it will reach the electrical plug. Uh -oh. uh, let, let's see. Where were we? <laughs> uh, basically, just you being confident on set because yeah, I was more. Of... I was definitely more confident. I felt like I could um, was allowed to have more say. Yeah. In in things like that, you know. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't say I was cocky, you know, <laughs> but I was more confident. Yeah. But if someone else observed something that I did on Nightmare Five set, please please come forth and I I will apologize. But honestly, it's <laughs> not like I yelled at anyone or anything like that. But I have more yeah. confidence. Like, well, I have accomplished a lead in the film, my first one, and now I have successful film. Now I and now I had this mm -hmm. new one. So I was a I was a more of a woman. Yeah. Let's put it that way. Yeah, for sure. Um, okay, so. That's the, that's the other thing. So, I mean, part four has this like very, very, um, it almost has a, uh, you just an epic look to it. Like, you know, it really looks like it was, um, you know, in almost in a different, at a different level than nightmare five, um, as far as just as visually, was that like, was that a conscious effort by, uh, the director, um, Hopkins, or do you think it was just a, it was a money thing? Um, I don't think it was a money thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, they raked in major, major dollars for Nightmare 4. So I, yeah. I can't imagine it was a money thing, but they're just completely different scripts. They're completely yeah. different stories. You know, Nightmare 5 is dark. It's yeah. very dark. It's also the, of all the Nightmare movies, it's the one that least, uh, that Robert England is even in. Mm -hmm. He had the least screen time than any of the other movies. Yeah, I don't know if that was a choice that I don't know about by the yeah. producers or him, or I have no idea. You know, I'm not privy to that information. Yeah, it is interesting actually, and that'd be a good question to figure out um, because you know it, it just the reason why is I mean part four makes so much money, and for example, I mean I think the budget for part four was thirteen million or something. I mean I could be a little bit off by that. Um, but the budget for part five was six to 8 million, you know, and it's, Oh, really? Yeah. Like, you know, and I mean, that's, that's a significant drop off for a movie that just, you know, made new line. Yeah. That doesn't make much sense. Does it? Right. Yeah. So, <laughs> 
So it just seems kind of weird. You that, have to you have know, a conversation with Bob Shade. I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to talk to him. He's, he's gonna have to stop avoiding my calls, and we're gonna have to get them. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I just always kind of wondered, like, why, you know, why when it's it it hit a peak, why you would intentionally kind of, you know, but. I guess you're just I don't know. no okay but you didn't feel that on set like you didn't feel like this film is you know cheaping out did you no no um okay so which which do you prefer part four or part five um you know that movie Sophie's Choice yeah <laughs> yes I do and you have to choose between your two children yeah okay all right so my answer is four because of the character arc I get to explore. Oh, okay. The character arc, playing that was just phenomenal. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why I say that. But I also love Five because it is a brave little film. It is a brave little film to yeah. hit all those very sensitive mm -hmm. moral choices, you know? Yeah. So uh, I also love Nightmare 5 because of the strength that Alice is fighting for her child. And she's like, uh, no, get out of my house. My father's yeah. supporting me. You know what I mean? This is my child, okay? Um, so, you know. It's a tough decision. There's my answer. But <laughs> you, yeah, you lean towards four, but it's a tough one. I a lean tough towards four, for but there's still elements of five that I really love. That's awesome. Yeah, and so do you, how often do you watch them? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I'm always curious because everybody's different, but I I get the opportunity to watch them. Um, you know, like uh, last October, I was did a kind of a tour. Uh, Ken Sago, Toy Newkirk, um, Nick Benson, and Mick Strawn and myself, we did sort of a two week tour at Pennsylvania, New Jersey, kind of all around. Mm -hmm. And one of them was showing Nightmare Four, and then with the microphone and Nick and Mick and we would stop the film, you know, people watching and we got to make comments about, well, this is what happened here. And this is what happened here behind the scenes stuff, you know, that That's you don't cool. know about. Um, cool. So I probably see, and that happens at conventions too. They'll air number four mm -hmm. or five. Uh, so I don't know, probably once a year, let's once say once. A year. A year. Okay. All right. <laughs> so Alice, as you know, uh, never died. She she survived. She's one of the only few, if not the only character of uh, major importance to survive Nightmare on Elm Street. So here's my question to you. If Alice were to die, how would you take her out? I, I have no idea. No? No. <laughs> I've been asked that, and I'm like... Have you really? Yeah. I, I have no idea. Because... <laughs> I, yeah, I'm not I, a I mean, writer. I don't no, know. I, <laughs> well, yes, you are. Uh, yes, you are. You told me that you wrote a scene and it was a great scene. So, okay. All right. Yes, fine. But, you it's know, I really just, um, I, I think the only thing I can say is it would be defending her son. She okay. would die defending her son. Right, However, so. that was going to be. She burns, she's dropped off the skyscraper, pushed out of a plane, whatever. It will be about defending Jacob. That right. I know. <laughs> okay, because you know it's funny because there's you know I I talk to a lot of uh, the actors that are in these films and they they really have drawn out you know scenarios for their character even though if their character is no no you know hasn't been in a film for twenty years but they still kind of know their path so that's why I thought you know maybe uh, I I fail yeah, no no you didn't fail I flunked. Now didn't... Robert's gonna kiss me and his dentures are gonna fall in his mouth my mouth no. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't fail. You, you've just you've you've moved on from the character, and that's fine. I've I've moved on, and I, I really think there needs to be a chapter for heaven's sakes. Please, what happened to Alice and Jacob? For heaven's sakes, you know yeah. what happened? I know. And okay, I, so, this is what I get asked constantly, constantly. Yeah. Were you, you know? And I'm like, Warner Brothers has it. It's up to them. You yeah. know. Was there ever a conversation to bring you back for part six? Mm -mm. No way. So nothing. That's, that's a shame. It's a miss, I think. But uh, they went on a different direction. So and so did you. Yeah, very much um, so. <laughs> so let's talk about these conventions. I mean, did you ever think that doing these films back then would give you the superhero treatment today? Nope. nope. It's pretty amazing. No idea. All right. No it's idea. Pretty, 
but how cool is it? I mean, all I know is back then it was old fashioned. You got fan mail. So, yeah. it, and it would, was sent to my agent. I had boxes of fan mail, which was really awesome. And mm-hmm. people tell, writing their story of how the character of Alice affected their lives, inspired them, kept them going. They had a crappy home life and, you know, you know, all, all of that, which was just like, oh my God, this is, which is one of the wonderful things about being an artist yeah. of any kind is the impact you could have on someone's life. Like yeah, really. For sure. Yeah. Um, so that was before computers <laughs> and all of that guys. Okay. <laughs> I so uh, I would say, um, yeah, no, the convention thing was, um, like who they won't buy my, they won't buy my autograph. <laughs> you know it's amazing um and uh yeah that's gotta feel good right that's amazing amazing because now i get instead of reading a letter i get to meet the person yeah right in person and they tell me their story their heartfelt story or whatever story it is oh my gosh it's just it's, it's wonderful it's really wonderful do you uh do you um do you enjoy going to them like how many do you go to yeah it's a good i time. love them yeah that's awesome. Oh, is there I any, love it. Is there any cities that you like to go to the most? Like, got to go to that one. Or is it just kind of... Uh, it really, it doesn't matter, small or big or whatever. It, it's, I really, two, two parts. I love meeting the fans. I really yeah. do. And I love hearing their stories. And I love what they bring to my table and things that they found on eBay or whatever. And I'm like, mm-hmm. and posters from all over the world. And I, it's just, it's just such... Um, a blessing it, re- yeah. it really is and secondly i get to hang out with my buddies you yeah. know like amanda and tuesday and toy and oh my god and robert and we all, you know we're the kind of franchise where like okay so we've had our show we're we're in the bar you can yeah. come talk to us in the bar you can hang out with us you know like That's we awesome. are like we're like we're, we're fun people <laughs> yeah so you, so you you have some good times so you have a nightlife when you go to these things too yes yes okay that that makes it fun that's awesome. Uh, so who, who do you hang out with? Just Elm Street people? Elm Street peeps? No, not necessarily. Although it ends up being that way because it's yeah. usually a large group of us. And we're catching up and we haven't seen each other in a while. And, you know, we're chit-chatting and chit-chatting and, and this and that. So it, it's typically it, it is. I mean, I certainly have other friends from like Felissa Rose and I are. Oh. Um, we've done some things where I was just the only nightmare person and she was just the only you know, and so we're getting to know each other better. But yeah, it does kind of end up being Nightmare on Elm Street people because we know each other. We've yeah, each exactly, other for exactly. Over thirty years. So what's uh, what's on the horizon for you? What's uh, what do you have coming up, and what are you doing these days? Um. Well, I, you know, I took a big break because I um, had two children and whatnot, and I I I pretty much stopped acting for quite a while. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I did start up pretty recently. Um, I did a wonderful movie called Mystery Spot, uh, filmed that in a little town in Texas, um, which I'm really excited about. And it's being submitted as we speak to Great. big film festivals and that kind of thing. It's a wonderful, wonderful role. Um, basically, basically a, a woman who's contemplating suicide. Oh, okay. And so I'm very proud of this part. Okay. And then I, well, <laughs> I had seven counts seven films i was gonna do last year oh geez <laughs> yeah oh. yeah yeah uh and like eight conventions i mean the year was like yeah. jam-packed so we all know what happened to 2020 right yeah, yeah yeah but anyway slowly the pieces are getting um the films projects are yeah. getting rescheduled one of which uh was rescheduled and i just literally got back from filming that 10 days ago um called seasons all right um his name the writer director is benjamin um swicker and it's a super fun role and it's literally basically a horror story for each season okay and then i did the one christmas hell So okay, it's that, really fun. That, see, that's smart. That's amazing because Christmas horror movies now are, I mean, everybody puts them on for Christmas now, like whether it's yeah. gremlins. And <laughs> stuff. So you're smart. So now you're not only in Nightmare on Elm Street, but now you're, you're attacking seasonal stuff. You're brilliant. Good job. There's, there's some wonderful projects that, like I said, didn't get to do last year, but yeah. um, 
uh, they're, 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 it's all happening and the conventions yeah. are coming back. I just came back from um, a show in New Jersey. I had the Dallas events. I had Houston. I had, you know, they're, they're slowly coming back and yeah. we're seeing such great news that the vaccine will um, be yeah. uh, available. Like, we'll all have it by the end of May. Yeah. Okay, it's like around nice. the corner. Yeah. It's so. always good to, uh, to, ha- to hopefully have uh, an end in sight for this madness, but uh, yeah. Um, I mean, it sounds like you're, 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 you know, you're back at it and in, uh, in, in high demand, which is, you know, great for, great for fans. Um, and we look forward to seeing you a lot more. And I guess that's pretty much it, Lisa. Okay. <laughs> I'd like cool. to thank you so much for coming on the show. You are so very welcome. Awesome. So that's it for the Slices podcast with Jason Pluger today. My special guest was Lisa Wilcox, and she hit it out of the park. And we'll see you. <laughs> we'll see you soon. Take care. Cheers.